。每个人都有说话的权利。高层的人可以听我们老百姓的话。呃，你可以做自己想做的事情，主是可以拿来讨论。平等吧，每个人都可以参与嘛，可以为自己的生活有一个相对的决定权。I can do whatever I want without interfere in others' freedom and in others' right. It's an ideal that people strive for, but as such, there's no true democracy anywhere in the world.、Uh, you need to power for the people. People live very good. People have food. People are happy. This is the most important things. Democracy is where the people choose their government. They are allowed to participate in elections, and they are empowered by knowing that whoever the majority in their country voted for will end up being the representatives and make important decisions for that country. Chinese democracy. 不是所谓的西方要的那个民主，但是绝对是适合我们自己的民主。那民主就是你要尊重每一个个体。China has also got the unique feature of being it's all Chinese people staying here, and they look out for each other, and there is respect. I mean, I don't find respect like this anywhere else in the world. Probably because we have been living different way of electing our candidates. And probably we are used to other kind of、um, parties, so we can choose among different parties. And I think it's an option that there is not here. So that's probably why we have different understanding of democracy. Communism isn't perfect, but it is working in China. And clearly, the people who live here, they are they have a lot of benefits that they get while being under communism. I've been for four years, and I can see even like the pollution levels in Beijing are less, even a short period like four years. The infrastructure is it's crazy. There's, there's nothing like it in the whole world. I've been to America and Europe. Africa. I choose to stay in China out of all those places. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the chat room live on CGTN. I'm Li Jingjing. So, ever since democracy has been created in ancient Greece 2,500 years ago, it has been explored by different countries and thrived across the world. But of course, democracy is in different forms, just like the clip we just saw, the Vox Pop. Different people have different opinions about democracy. So today we've invited guests from different countries, different backgrounds, to share their understandings and their analysis of democracy. So, and of course, if you have any questions, feel free to leave your questions in the comment sections on CGTN's YouTube, Facebook, Yang Shiping, Weibo, Twitter. We will try to answer your questions at the end of this show. But first, let me introduce our amazing lineup of speakers today. And we have some guests joining us here on set. And、uh, we'll start with Professor Liu Liu Zhiqin, Chinese scholar. Hello, everybody. My name is Liu Zhiqin from Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, Renmin University. I'm happy here to discuss all the major points with all of you. Thanks Thank for、you. being here, Professor Liu. And also, we have this handsome young man, and he's from. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> I'm talking about you. He's from、uh, Hong Kong, as they are.、Mm. Enoch Wang.、Uh, hi everyone. My name is Enoch.、Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, China.、Uh, I also studied and lived in the UK for ten years、mm -hmm. uh, uh, before going to a couple of other countries in Africa and Asia. And now I'm back to China. I'm currently in Beijing as a, a senior manager. For online education and international cooperation at Tsinghua University. Welcome, Enoch. And、Thank、also,、you. this handsome young man behind him is a Russian.、Um, yep. And hello, everyone. My name is Nick. I'm a student of international relations,、mm -hmm. School of Social Sciences at Tsinghua University. Also, I'm a Shanghai Cooperation Organization Youth Platform Scholar member. And I have been living in China for 16 years. 16 years. That's a really long time. Oh yeah. And also, <laughs> this handsome young man is Belo Gandachi, U.S. journalist. Belo. Hello, everyone.、Uh, my name is Belo Gandachi, and I'm a U.S. journalist.、Uh, I worked for Voice of America for four years, and now I'm doing、uh, research on education here in China. 
Mm, welcome. Thank you. And also today we also have three guests joining us online. And first, I will introduce Sarah Flounder joining us from New York. I know you wake up so early. So sorry this for this time differences, Sarah. Can you Hello, uh, and it's good to be here, even early in the morning. Uh, I am 50 years a political activist and organizer in the United States uh, with the International Action Center, the Sanctions Kill campaign. I'm a journalist with Workers World, a contributing editor, and uh, taken part in many campaigns for democracy here in the U.S. It's a, Long struggle. We're far from it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for making the effort joining us. And also, our next guest is uh, uh, Roland Bauer. And uh, Roland? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very, very much. I'm really looking forward to this, this important discussion on democracy. I'm, I was born in Australia, but um, I'm a professor at uh, the School of Marxism at Dalian University of Technology in Dalian, China. Thank you. And our next guest. Uh, okay, now I see you, Adam. Earlier, I, your screen, your connections wasn't really good, but good to see you, Adam Saeed. So tell us more about yourself. Yeah, I'm Adhan Sayed. I'm from Lebanon, and uh, but now I'm uh, living in China and uh, in Hangzhou, and I'm uh, uh, assistant professor and uh, researcher with uh, uh, Chinese uh, Arab uh, BRI uh, Research Center at uh, Zhejiang Gongchang University here in Hangzhou. Welcome. Okay, now we know everybody. So first, of course, we are here to talk about democracy. So my first question is. If you have to choose one word to describe democracy, what's democracy to you, which word would you choose and why? Who shall start? Bello, you're staring at me, <laughs> like you look like you're ready to answer. All right, I will go with prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, any situation where a society can prosper, live in peace and harmony and have opportunities to gain education mm -hmm. and to be happy, I think that should be democracy. It doesn't matter how it's achieved. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mark? Mm. I would say people, right? Uh, people is in demos Kratos, the Greek work of democracy in the European language. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, just like the video clip just showed just now, I don't uh, necessarily agree with everyone's thoughts and opinion. But everyone is entitled to it, just like uh, those street interview in China, right? They're entitled to have, you know, that right, and that's a basis of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really do enjoy uh, to touch on one of the things that the video mentioned, um, having, ha having, having lived or having been alive is democracy itself. Um, I think most often uh, uh, people take it for granted. But, but very unfortunately, the 800,000 people who lost their life because of COVID in the US can't say so. So people really is the center for democracy for me. Mm -hmm. Professor Liu, what's your thought? No, no I, I prefer to use another word, that inclusiveness mm -hmm. instead of harmony. Mm -hmm. Because inclusiveness is so important for the purpose and the result of democracy. We can see what happened in the United States. They always say that they have democracy, but in fact, they have only democracies. Because <laughs> whenever they have democracies everywhere, during election, during the uh, COVID-19 fighting, they have only crazy democracies there. They don't have any uh, democracies. Mm -hmm. What they need is inclusiveness of the society. Mm -hmm. If they have inclusiveness, they have respect to each other, they can make more attention to each other's interests then they have the so-called real democracy. How about you? Well, I think I would say equality. I think that what democracy is trying to do is to establish equality among humans mm -hmm. so that everyone will have an equal chance. That's what I think. Very good answer. And I will also turn this question to our online, online guests. Uh, how about we start with you, Roland? Uh, Yes, short uh, way of putting it, no one is left behind. It means all people and literally all people. So no one's left behind. 
Mm. How about you, Sarah? Well, I would say participation. Participation in the making of decisions. Uh, here in the U.S., you know, you, you can't really vote or decide on any issue that impacts your life. It's all decided by a tiny, tiny fraction of the super rich, the owners, the owners. So we can't vote on issues of war or the military funding, which grabs half the budget. We can't vote on a national health plan. And really, this is the cause of 800,000 deaths in the US, there's no coordination. It's really uh, for profit, for profit of a tiny handful, and they make the decisions. So democracy would mean really an end to corporate rule. Mm. And last but not least, Adam, what's your word for democracy? Yeah. Yeah, I like that I'm the last one, so I, I agree with all what, what you said before. And uh, I, I would like just to add one point about like, yeah, like what Enoch said, people is the main important things and people first. And here we're, we're, when we are speaking about people, we are speaking about the happiness of people. We are speaking about solve people's problem, you know? And, and also when we are speaking about people, we are speaking about the majority of people not like for example in in many countries the top 10 percent but we are speaking most of time about the bottom 50 percent mm. those who are li like who should like give more attention for them mm. thank you and of course democracy has been the buzzword in the past few days has been taken over all the headlines on all medias across the globe because uh, the summit for democracy um, held by the US just closed and of course we are also here to share what's our thoughts on democracy but first uh, besides you guys joining us live we also have some some guests who already made a pre-recording video to share their takes and first we're gonna show you a clip from uh, Tim Lin he is the chief editor of College Daily and College Daily is the media that very popular among Chinese students who studied in the U.S. And let's take a look. What's his thought? We can see many Chinese students come to the United States for the higher education. Also, they are expecting to learn more about American societies and democracy. However, we find out there are more and more Chinese students are questioning and doubting the democracy in America. In the past four years, we see a race on the hate crime against Asians, especially on the Chinese. At the same time, that Chinese students are facing the threat by the racism and the violence. Donald Trump has applied many restrictions on the Chinese students who wish to study in the United States. Many of them cannot get the visa even though they have gotten the offer from the Ivy League universities, they are wondering why a so-called democratic nation can threat a foreign student like this. We have witnessed many moments of chaos in the United States these years. For example, this year, January the 6th, the Trump supporters has broken into the Capitol Hills and we can see the shootings and the chaos in the Congress. It's hard to persuade a foreign students that this is how the American democracy is like. Also, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we see the people all rally on the street that fight against the government pandemic control policies. Every each other moment like this is challenging our expectations on the American democracy. Mm. And many of you already touched on that, but I think let's start our first discussion. It is about this uh, summit for democracy that just closed. What's your thought? What, what, what's your feeling about the summit for democracy? So shall we start with someone from here on set? Who wants to jump in? By the way, this is a discussion. I hope everyone can jump in to share their opinions. So feel free, if you want to add something, feel free, let me know, give me a shout. 
let's have a discussion. So, Bello, you give me this look again. <laughs> like you look like you're always ready to give a full speech. <laughs> well, when you have the boss uh, disagreeing with some of his employees mm -hmm. or some of his uh, neighbors, let's say, mm -hmm. but then invites only the people that he likes to push his ideas more and tell you how to live in your house, what rules you should use inside your house to your own family, hey, what kind of food you should eat. Mm -hmm. While the only reason why he is doing that and restricting those who are not there is because they want to model themselves as this is the right way of doing things. And how is that helping anyone? Mm -hmm. Very good point. And also, I want to pass the question to our next guest because, uh, <laughs> Nick, you are from Russia. Russia was not invited to the summit. Well, so. I mean, what a surprise. <laughs> the relationship between Russia and U.S. was always kind of complicated. So what I think this summit is all about is just U.S. meeting with its allies and just talking about how good their democracy is and how bad that other countries are doing. Uh, I want to ask Sarah, uh, joining us from New York though, you, you probably w read all the news about the summit of democracy. What's your thought on this summit? Well, this, is, this summit on democracy is really cynical political theater. It's uh, trying to use a platform to lock countries into an aggressive military policy. It's an effort to justify, on the world stage, hmm. a policy of sanctions, of war, of military threats, uh, to forge a political bloc against China, against Russia, against other countries that are sanctioned, uh, justifying sanctions now on 39 countries, a third of the world population. How do they do that? They do it in the name of democracy, this is really such a fraud, really such a fraud. And to say this is re showing respect for human rights, that that's what they want to build, that's not what they are about building. And every speech showed this effort to form a block of countries against other countries in a very dangerous way and to break cooperation. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Professor Liu, what's your thoughts on this topic? I think uh, most of the people believe that the uh, Democracy Summit is only a political show, especially for the Biden administration to show it's uh, the fake democracy. As we know already, it's not a democracy, but only a democracy, because it shows the arrogance, aggressive attitudes of the American politicians toward the, the world uh, uh, security, especially to the peaceful people there. If the summit is really named as democracy. They should invite all the countries who are willing to come mm. to discuss democracy. Should not use democracy to define in two groups in the world, which country belongs to democratic country, which not belong. This is a very wrong doing. It's because it's made a separation and the division of the global the economy and the global society. So that's why we should say that this summit is really a fake summit. It's only for the political purpose of the American administration. Do nothing good for the global interests. So we should really continue to criticize and also to speak up to show the truth of the summit mm. in the U.S. Thank you, Professor Liu. It's, it's ironic that the summit on democracy is very undemocratic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. And actually, sure. I want to pass this question to you sure. because uh, Biden invited this fugitive Hong Kong a violent protest student leader, Nathan Law, to speak at this summit for democracy. Mm. And during the speech, actually, Nathan Law said um, um, ha how Hong Kong has turned to a police state. He's basically asking U.S. politicians to intervene for interventions in Hong Kong. You are from Hong Kong. Yes. You're a young person too, probably just the same age like him. What's your I don't your want thought? to be compared to him in any way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, I, I agree. It, it's been the talk of the town, so to speak, in, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, so first of all, let me say, I, I think uh, it, it, it sounds desperate 
uh, I think it's a very desperate attempt uh, by the Biden administration uh, to interfere in someone else's business. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's very difficult to take this seriously, you know, in any way or form. I, I think that's first and foremost. Uh, secondly, um, you know, as the nature of its own, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's interference. Right in, in someone else's business, so so uh, you know it, it's, it's not you know rumor or, or someone thinking out of the head. You know we are seeing this on the world stage, and the Biden administration is giving a world platform to such rumor and and, and falsehood. Um, third is that you know to put it into perspective, or for example, for some of the U.S. viewers or Western viewers, is that you know why I, I would ask why wouldn't the Biden administration to invite you know, some of the January 6th U.S. Capitol attack, you know, rioter in. You know, they are fighting for democracy as well. Why don't we hear from them too? Um, or, or alternatively, what if China holds our own democracy summit, and which we we'll never do because we support multilateralism, but then if we do and we invite some of the attackers from the Capitol riot, you know, you know to speak on, on, on behalf of U.S., I, I don't think they would be happy either. So I think there's a lack of empathy whatsoever in this. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds like a joke, um, though I think uh, some of the Hong Kong citizen is, is, is sad to, to see it, it, it comes to this, right? It reminded a very painful period um, where, you know, the, the, it's, it's very dangerous to walk on the streets. It, it, it feels like it's not our home. But uh, thanks to some of the uh, measures that, you know, everything is, is more peaceful now, um, I, I think it, it helps us to get back our home, uh, you know, a peaceful place that we uh, can be proud of once again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And also, you know what, to me, the hypocritical part is sure. uh, when, when he's calling for interference in Hong Kong, actually, when he asks people, students to do violent protests in Hong Kong, he's like, you go do the protest violently, but then because of he's the leader, he got scholarship from Yale, yeah. and then he also seeked asylum from the UK, so he's not a Hong Kong citizen anymore. So when he's asking for interventions, uh, violence in Hong Kong, it, does, it has nothing to do with him. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a large discussion in Hong Kong as well, you know, why don't you tell us your citizenship, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's one side. I think the other side is, is so unfair. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to also hear from some of the followers or previous followers of him, it is it, to see that double standard or what some would call no standard, <laughs> right, from, from his side. That leaving, you know, people who, who have fought for democracy or in the name of democracy with him, but now are facing, uh, you know, the consequences, whereas he can flee somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, um, if he were to fight the fight, he would have stayed in Hong Kong, right, uh, and, 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 and continue uh, fighting for whatever he believed in in a lawful manner. Um, I do believe, you know, word matters, but action speaks louder. Uh, and he's currently behaving, in my opinion, like a coward, mm -hmm. that he's just running away from the problem itself. Thank you. And I'm wondering whether uh, Roland and Adam want to uh, add something in this question too? <laughs> uh, just very briefly, yes. Uh, the fa very fact that uh, the United States felt that it needed to um, uh, call this so-called summit indicates a weakness uh, because reality is in Western countries that Western democracies have been uh, stagnating and are now declining and uh, the the tape we heard earlier from uh, uh, from the US and the experience of Chinese students shows that very well but it's also the case in Western Europe and other countries so it's a sign of weakness and also like Enoch said it's very undemocratic move. Undemocratic in two ways, that it, the invitation did not go out to all countries in the world to discuss openly democracy, and secondly it's undemocratic when one country tries to tell other countries what democracy is and how it should be practised. When we are talking democracy, we should not forget to talk another part. Democracy, the problem is like two sides of the hand, one side and one side is the back hand. Democracy is one side, the other is the rule of law. What happened in Hong Kong in Rio? What happened in the United States? Why we see the democracy in the United States is democracy? Because they don't have the rule of law. 
even they believe, uh, blend them themselves, they are rule of law country. But in fact, in the United States, they don't have the rule of law. That's why their democracy does not work. This is the point. So because of rule of law not effectively operated in the United States, so that's why the democracy cannot work, cannot really be merged in the society. This is the point that we should pay attention to have a real rule of law. Mm. This is the support oh, of the democracy. To, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, Sarah. What do you want to add? Well, the uh, US has been at this for years, uh, labeling their interference, their funded interference in other countries as democracy. The National Endowment for Democracy provides the NED funding, as it's called, hundreds of millions of dollars, and really puts, uh, creates organizations in Hong Kong, yes, uh, but organizations around the world, organizations that are to put out fake news on Xinjiang, on uh, one country after another. This was certainly true also against Russia and in Eastern Europe. Uh, and throughout Latin America, in Venezuela, against Cuba. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy is really putting on their payroll, not just individuals, but entire organizations, student organizations, union groups, uh, everything to counter, to counter the very country where they are operating and attempt to bring chaos and confusion to pull it apart. That's the purpose of this, this US funded program. So these are not just individuals operating on their own. They are the paid agents. And we just <laughs> shouldn't forget that, the paid agents of the US government. They take this money in their pocket, along with scholarships and all sorts of benefits uh, to operate in, in US interests and to create attempt to create turmoil in the countries where they're operating. But it's in the name of democracy. Yeah. Thank you so much for pointing that out, Sarah. That actually a lot of movements uh, that look spontaneous, but actually not, are actually founded by a certain groups, just like what happened in Hong yeah. Kong. And Adam, I, I see you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the American politicians are playing an old dangerous game. And I mean by that the Cold War, you know, but this will give them nothing now. Because they have to know that the world changed, you know. China, it's, today it's at the heart of the world economy. They can't play the same game as that they did with, uh, with the Soviet Union. And, and also the, so, the, the United States, it's not the same. Also the United States, the state changed. So uh, uh, really it's enough. It's enough to play those games. It's enough to, to export war. You know, we need, we need a new world, but not like this one. We, know, we need more peaceful one. So I think this is a very dangerous game, but it will not work. Thank you, Adam. And also, because of the Summit for Democracy, it's kind of like certain countries dominate the, 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 the choice, like who is democ democratic, who is not. If you are getting invited, you are. If you are not getting invited, you are not democracy. But I mean, that comes to my next question. Who can define democracy? Who really should be the one to define um, whether our country is a democracy or not? So, you know? Cool. Um, I think each country has the right to define democracy for their own people but no country has the right to impose or export their model for democracy because democracy only works right, for their own people and that's by definition itself. So coming from a background where you know, previously we've been discussing about the Hong Kong events, etc., cetera, um, you know, UK has been doing their fair share and try to influence Hong Kong's uh, political system and governance system. But, but let me remind people in, from the historical point of view that over the 156 years that the British Empire have ruled Hong Kong or colonized Hong Kong, there was no democracy, 
right? Right. The the governors, right? The governors weren't selected by the people, right? It was assigned, right,、mm. by by the government.、Mm. And 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 let me be clear, it, it was the Chinese Communist Party that fought for the democracy for the Hong Kong people. That when it returned, finally returned back to、uh, back to the Re- People's Republic of China in 1997, it wasn't the Queen, <laughs> it wasn't the Governor of Hong Kong, which, by the way, wasn't elected by anyone. So, so that's from my personal experience of you know ha- having 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 witnessed that、uh, firsthand and the trouble that it created.、Um, so, so as I said, you know, everyone has a right to to define democracy for their own people, but it shouldn't be imposed or exported anywhere else because it simply doesn't work. And let me add just one more thing: if U.S. attempt to do that, I think first it's very difficult to copy because they spent fourteen billion dollars in twenty twenty to elect a president.、I'm, It's very difficult for any for any other country to copy、mm-hmm. that at all. If they do, they wouldn't dare to do so because seeing the results of 2020 and 2021, I'm not sure anyone would love to copy that.、Um, mm. So, so that's my my take on this. Very good point. That, that, that's why our institute has made a report. We say that in the United States they have money crazy,、mm. gun crazy, drug crazy, <laughs> violence crazy. They have everything crazy, but no democracy. So it's not important to say that who defined democracy. It's important that who can say his country is democratic or not. Only the people living in the country, they have the right to do so. I, I want to sorry. I add <laughs> one more point because the <laughs> professor just reminded me of this. Is so I I I think I want to be fair to say liberal democracy once worked. It's not all bad, right? Once worked and and even. You know,、uh, during earlier days, right?、Uh, in, in China, we tried. It's not that China didn't try a different form of Western democracy. We、mm-hmm. tried; it failed completely.、Mm. So, so that's why we were trying to find the way of governance for China, and that's what the Communist Party did, right? It, it's not as if it doesn't. It didn't take any reference. It, 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 it,、um, I, I don't think I'm saying that U.S. democracy or democracy from the West never worked. It worked in a while, but I think now. Um, like any other country, I think it's a continuous process of exploration、mm-hmm. um, in the era. That's、mm. um, talking about.、Um, um, right? I'm sorry,、yes. I'm gonna interrupt you because、uh, Nick was like、okay. always <laughs> talking to me for so many times. Okay. So I think that every country should have its own perspective and definition of democracy. So I think that every country should have its own perspective and definition of democracy. For example,、uh, the political system in modern Russia, often seen as sovereign democracy. It has a parliament. It has、uh, opposition. It has the、uh, few parties, and it also has、uh, elections. But、uh, it also has a very strong state power,、um, and it's very different from the U.S. and Western-style democracy. But we have tried to use the model of U.S. and Western-style democracy back in the 90s, and it failed, just as Anak said, China did as well. And what I want to say is that. Uh, democracy is not the patent of some countries, nor it can be de- def-、uh, defined by only the Western values or ideologies.、Mm, very well said, indeed. Like,、um, I mean, democracy, the American-style democracy worked for America at least, maybe. Uh, like Biden said during the summit, it's backsliding. They are trying to renew it and、um, fix it, but then it worked for America. But doesn't mean this form of democracy can work for other countries. Just look what happened to、uh, former Soviet Union or Arab Arab countries after Arab Spring, and also during China.、Mm. Before what we ha- what ha- we are doing this、uh, socialist democracy, we tried different forms、yeah. in the history, but didn't work. So now we find so we still have democracy, but we adopted to China's unique historical cultural background, unique、um, styles. That's what we call socialism with Chinese characteristics. So everything is with Chinese characteristic, and it's worked here. And Bello, you. Yes. <laughs>、uh, what what well, he said. Also, when when he said. Just to say, does. All right. Go ahead, Sarah. Well. I, I just want to a little bit challenge this.、Uh, does does it work here? <laughs> okay. I really, I have to say no in this country where the infrastructure is actually crumbling. I think democracy is a political word that inspires, but the real question is what class is in power, and in the United States. 
the, you could say the 1% uh, corporate power, the capitalist class, they decide every fundamental question. Now, the difficulty is their power is waning and, and they contend with each other. The average person has no say in this. Uh, and yet, uh, you, there's a struggle still for political democracy. But economic democracy is left out of it totally. And China, by addressing really the fundamental of economic democracy, if you lift 800 million people out of poverty, this is the, their ability then to participate in society. Because when you, when you can't eat, when you don't have education, then how can you participate in society? And this is what is forgotten uh, intentionally or never included in, in the United States. Economic rights to health care, to education, free education. Uh, the number of homeless people here in the United States today is actually growing. And it's a reason also that violence is growing because there is such an alienation and, and frustration. So uh, I, I do think this is a question of, of what class is, is in power here. Uh, really, the society exists to protect this small group of capitalists, protect their rights, not our rights, not the rights of working people at all. But they continue to use the word. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work very well. Mm. Bello, what you're just saying? Yeah, so what I want to say, I want to go back to what he started talking about uh, the British and uh, Hong Kong and all that influence. Mm -hmm. uh, a good question to ask is which countries are actually real countries? Because to be honest, one of the main problems of this world is many countries, they didn't come together by themselves. No, it's the British who curved them. Many different societies with different historical backgrounds, different uh, philosophies, and they have to be forced to live together. And look at those countries today. What are they really? Can they, can they be a normal country? Can they have a democracy? That's a good question. And then when we're talking about you take one system and you put it into another, there are different brands of cars in the world. There's Honda, there's Toyota, there's Mercedes-Benz. Do you just take an engine of a Mercedes and put it in a Toyota and think it's going to work? Each has different background. Each has different mm. foundation, different philosophy, different ways it works. And then the last one uh, to connect with Sarah here is uh, corporate power. Now, why, do you, why would we call that democracy when companies and corporations sponsor people who should be elected? The only face or advertisement or commercial you see when it comes to campaigns, it's people who actually have deep pockets or who have companies giving them a lot of money so that you can see them and choose to vote or not vote for them. Do you really think those people are going to work for you or work for the company? That, those are the three points I really wanted to throw in there. Mm, very well said. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Roland and Adam, do you want to add something here? Yeah. Oh, I think people, people have covered uh, most things. Uh, maybe we can just go back to the basic meaning, uh, it's been mentioned already, of democracy. I mean, the English word, and in quite a few Western languages, comes from ancient Greeks. Um, democratia, and obviously in, in Chinese it's mitu. It means the rule of the people, or the people are in control, or people are masters of the country. And so if that's the case, and this is reinforcing what's already been said, the democratic approach to defining democracy is for people in places, in cultures, in civilizations and countries to come up with a system that works in their particular place in light of their histories and cultures. Thank you, Roland. Adam. Yes, uh, I think like, like Roland, he, he make a definition, general definition of democracy, and this we can do it, and that's what we did during the first part of this interview. So, but no one has the right to say that this is the perfect model and all people, all countries should follow it. And here the main problem is that those who benefit from the American system, and, and I'm stressed on benefit, as Sarah said, you know, want us to say that this is the perfect model and we should follow it. And, and the biggest problem is that not just uh, uh, want us 
they push us to follow them. You know, so if you say this is not good for for my people or or like for my characteristic, as you you you, you said before, you directly will be like uh, uh, named as a terrorist or as a dictator, and they will start to make for you problem. And this is what's happened, like uh, you know, in, in Middle East we have war everywhere, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, in uh, in uh, Palestine everywhere in, in Afghanistan, now in Iran, and also in American Latin. So directly you will be terrorist or dictator, and they will make for you a problem. And, and the problem like that, maybe for us, war is a terrible thing. But for, for those who lead the United States, war is itself a great business for them, you know? So, and, and here I, I will make like quick conclusion that there is a serious question about if that model, the American model, is a real democracy, you know? Many scholars conclude that the U.S. is functioning as a plutocracy instead of democracy. And I think they are totally right in this point. But this inside the United States, but if we look at the global level, I think the, the good definition is that it's imperialism or imperialistic uh, system. Mm. And if you give me just a second, I, I will divide the reason of, of this conclusion for two groups. And of course, I'm not going to speak about all reasons because I need long, long time. So inside US, there is for me like two big problems. The first one is that racism and hate. And, and we all uh, uh, remember, like, uh, I can't breathe. So, for me, this, this system is I can't breathe system, not a democratic system. So, because racism and democracy, democracy can't live together, impossible. And the second problem, it's part of, part of my work, it's about the income and wealth inequality. Of course, there is many kinds of other inequality, but I will focus on, on this one. So, a system that produce very high inequality rate cannot be uh, democratic, as Sarah said. So, also we still remember Occupy Wall Street movement and the famous slogan like 99% of the people against the first percent of the rich. And, and here, uh, uh, what's his name? Joseph uh, Stiglitz said that yeah, you, the US is now government of the 1% by the 1% and for the 1%, and he's totally right. But I, I will add, at the global level, this is inside the United States, but at the global level, the American system, again, has a one definition. It's an imperialism. And I, we, we face this in the Middle East, you know, we are living with them there. The regime that spreads war, destroy country, and kill people, under the pretext of spreading democracy, cannot be democratic. So, uh, uh, there is a famous uh, question about like, can a country be a democracy if it oppresses other nation? For me, sure, it cannot. Thank you so much. And also, while we are last streaming, have this discussion, we have several viewers who already mm -hmm. left some comments mm -hmm. um, and on YouTube and on Facebook. So I will try to read some comments here. I'm not just playing with my phone <laughs> <laughs> during the work. During the work. So I mean, seriously, that director sent me some comments. So from YouTube, Abdul, uh, he said, it is an amount of free society. All leaderships and governance related to institutions and procedures strive to achieve or the list of it, to safeguard their future and that of their kind. Hmm. Language is a little bit, but I, I think I, we can get what, 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 what he idea, meant. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, on Facebook, Matt Moran, he said, democracy in the West is a shame. We get a say every few years to choose between parties that are so alike, they are the same. We don't get a say on individual issues, and our leaders don't get selected by merit. I think that's kind of uh, similar to what Sarah yeah. Yeah. mentioned earlier on many major issues that impact people's life. Um, I think many people feel they don't have the 
choice to to mm. to vote. And <laughs> this is also okay. Nohami Demisi. He's she said democracy born in Greek, dead at America. <laughs> 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 That's right. Strong comment. Um, and let me. See. Oh, there are so many. Okay, let me choose a few because there are so many. Uh, there's no time to read all of them. Usman uh, Udin, democracy means to be free to live life as you desire, uh, keeping that your freedom doesn't interfere with the freedom and the rights of others. Mm. And from YouTube, and this person said, democracy is a form of government in which the people have the authority to deliberate and decide legislation, or to choose governing officials to do so. That is democracy. Yes, mm. it is uh, in the definition. And the court, Muhammad Ali Fahad. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name right. If I'm <laughs> pronouncing your name That's wrong, just right. like uh, I apologize. Uh, but uh, he left a comment saying, with the spread of globalization and economic competition, the future of democracy is insulting human beliefs in freedom. It's now become the government of minority rather than majority. Mm. Judy Inns, the freedom of democracy will come at a price of delayed progression and improvement of quality of lives. And uh, uh, on YouTube, this person said, Brexit is a good example of democracy. Well, well mm, you live in the UK for 10 years. <laughs> I, I, it's not as a good example, but yes, it, it is an example of liberal, liberalism, mm. right? Having people deciding the fate of a country. Mm. Uh, uh, I, and, and, and that's an, an exercise, I think, that demonstrates uh, with the example of Brexit, etc., that a lot of times you know, um, majority doesn't majority rules doesn't necessarily agree with everyone as well. If if, if that's the case, then then there isn't that much you know trouble afterward as well. Mm. Um, so Nick yeah, wants yeah. to jump in. I also think that this should. <laughs> I also like your raise your hand. I like <laughs> in, in uh, school. I grew up in China. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, about the Brexit, I think like democracy should have a bit of regulations because in that way, how can you keep the country as a whole? Because if everyone wants to separate, then the country is finished. Mm -hmm. So I think democracy should also have a bit regulations. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think uh, that, that also, at the same time, it also depends on, you know, democracy or one person, one vote would work in an ideal situation where our voters are informed with accurate and correct information. With the example of Brexit, there are so much inaccurate uh, or what you would now call fake news or alternative facts, what Donald Trump would like to call them, um, you know, that was going on. So therefore, it, it, it falsely informed the citizen of, of Britain and then delivering, you know, false promises, which now the country need to live with. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I, I think, uh, you know, some of the you know, UK viewers who are feeling this, you know, they will have much stronger reflection mm -hmm. on to whether this is the perfect situation. Yes, it would be in the ideal world, but unfortunately, you know, with current situation and technologies, with media influences, it, it might not necessarily you know, be the best way forward then. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. And no, I come in and make a comment yeah, here. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Mm. Very quickly, uh, it's been shown up now by survey after survey in um, Western liberal, or I think we should call them Western capitalist democracies, that trust in governance or government and public institutions keeps declining. Uh, it's only around 40, 45% of populations actually trust uh, their governments and the public institutions. That shows up in all sorts of other ways, as Enoch was just saying, that people don't trust the mainstream media in these countries, so they go to all sorts of other sorts of information. Um, and the mainstream media is pretty, pretty bad, but they go to other sources, all sorts of stuff that happens. You have a prevalence of conspiracy theories, etc., etc., etc. This has been a very long-term trend. It's shown up more, obviously, in the last year or two. And that's another significant problem and a sign of, of uh, not just stagnation, but fragmentation and decline. Mm. 
very interesting. I, I want to can I follow up on two very very quick points. <laughs> sure. I, I think, uh, one one point yeah. is that. Um, uh, oh. sh shall we go with uh, no, Sarah first? Uh, maybe I will let Enoch okay. Uh, okay. add his two points yes, first, very, and then we'll jump quickly. to you, Sarah. <laughs> so, so sometimes I, I often get very confused, right? You know, having lived in you know Western democracy, etc., is that sometimes I get very confused when you know a leader get elected, you know, get over fifty-one percent and got elected through election, and then suddenly their approval, literally after just a few months or few days, it just dropped yeah. to thirty, forty percent. So. So really, I think that, that, that I think that one for me illustrate you know how the turnout rate you know do you actually get high turnout rate if you get constantly below half of your population turning out for you know voting for election, how much does it say for you know democracy of a country? I think I think that's one thing. The other thing what Roland mentioned going back to Asian you know Greek with with the you know, definition democracy exists far before. United States, right? You know, it exists in Greek or, or in some of the texts in Chinese texts previously as well. But but I think let, 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 I think going back and, and trying to have a better understanding is that U.S. is when U.S. was founded, it was founded not on the idea of democracy. It was founded on the idea of you know not idea, but it was founded on slavery, where you know if you are in certain you know if you're a woman you don't get votes, right? If you're in certain class and certain race you don't get votes. So, so I don't think the idea of democracy is inherited, you know, by the U.S. and 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 they don't have the default right to speak on democracy. Uh, I think it's a continuous process of exploration uh, mm. and development. Mm. That, that's my two cents. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I couldn't agree more, and this is just a fascinating discussion. Let me say because. We're taking the whole the whole world, um, <laughs> so it, it's it's very very true. We have uh, two politicians who are vetted by corporate power, by the banks, who can best uh, carry out their aims, not not our aims, but who could best put forward, who's the best actor in this moment in time. Now, I want to describe another thing, which is so undemocratic and yet silent, and the people of the United States don't get to decide. And that is the US policy of sanctioning countries around the world. If ever you could picture a dictatorship of US corporate power on one country after another to literally shut off food, fertilizer, fuel, medicine, decide who can, who can have essential supplies, who can uh, literally stop the globalization of trade. This is really the dictatorship of corporate power, and it's done up country after country. Fifteen African countries now sanctioned by the United States. Syria, unable to rebuild. Look what they've done to Lebanon with the sanctions. Unable even to have fuel for the hospital generators. Uh, this is a dictatorship of U.S. corporate power, and it is so undemocratic. And that was the purpose, was the purpose of Biden's summit on democracy, to try to weld together a bloc to enforce sanctions and a new military bloc. It has just nothing to do with democracy. And, and no one here in the United States could really participate in this discussion. Mm. It's very important to point out the fact that sanctions, because I think a lot of people from the very developed countries, when they pointing fingers at certain countries, look, they are so backward. There's there's so much chaos in that country. It's exactly because of those sanctions, those countries were right. cut out from 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 everything: materials, medicines, uh, basic for, for metal, medicines. That's what led to those countries forever in chaos, in struggle, poor. So very important to thank you for pointing that out, Sarah. And what do you want to add, Bello? Yes, I'm glad you know <laughs> I wanted to add something. Um, so for those viewers online um, who have kids, uh, imagine the superpower or a very powerful country being a teacher. And those other countries around the world are students. This is what I know. Different kids learn in different ways. Mm -hmm. You cannot use the same methodology to teach them. Some learn by using their hands. Some are very physical. Some are very artistic. Some are, they, they want something that has, uh, 
you know, different ways. And you have to adopt different kids so that they can all learn and reach that lesson objective. But just because a student doesn't learn from the way you impose on them, and then you sanction, you punish them, will that make them a better student? Will that help them learn more or actually reject studies and school more? Mm. Very interesting, using your experience as teacher <laughs> <laughs> to, to explain this. Very interesting. And also, uh, I want to move to the next topic uh, because uh, uh, some of you probably already noticed that China a few weeks ago issued this white paper mm. on China's democracy, democracy that works, which explains the whole process, people's democracy. So um, probably a lot of people are still confused with uh, what was uh, at fir first, probably a lot of people, especially in Western countries, they're probably going to sh be shocked. What? There's democracy in China? <laughs> <laughs> but then second, what, what's the whole process, people's democracy? So I'm wondering, Professor Liu, can you tell us, uh, w explain more to our viewers what's whole process, people's democracy? Yeah, this issue is a big uh, issue. We need uh, maybe three days to discuss, but I just give you a uh, sh short explanation. You know, in China, the political system is based on the uh, People's Congress and also Consultancy Commission, the Congress. By these two uh, commissions are very important uh, political basic in China. The People's Congress is elected by the local people to re represent their benefits and their interests, to announce their wishes to the government, what to do, what the policy they need, what they are concerned. The political uh, consultants commission is for all these uh, people that we call the non-communist party, that their members, they are gathering together every uh, two months, every three months, they are discussing the big issues, what the central government has already announced to give their ideas and the suggestions, even criticism to readjust this policy. That's why these two keep well balanced. That's why I always say that China's democracy is always keep good balance, that from the People's Congress and also from the Consultancy Congress. By both sides, they need negotiations. That's why we say the real democracy in China is inclusiveness, that all the people, they should have the good understanding with each other not try to create misunderstanding. That's why we always say that in China, our democracy is trying to make harmony, mm. to make the, all the opinions united together. We do not want to make oppositions, like some countries, they mentally, they artificially create so-called uh, opposition parties just to show their democracy they make the long-term fightings against each other. It's a waste of the time and the currencies of the people. So that's why totally different from China. We made our conversation, we make discussion, we made our coordination, it's very important. That to make our so social society is very inclusiveness with understanding. That's why in China, we have some people in different opinions, for instance, family planning, education method, and also environment. Many people, they have different opinion, even criticism the local government. But they, through the negotiations and also dialogue, and also the discussion with the government, we do not create any artificial opposition. That makes the social society very uh, harmonious. So that's a very important point. Mm. Thank you, Professor Liu. Uh, Nick, you've been living in China for a really long time. You also yes. study international Relation. relations. Yep. So how do you see China's political system? Well, I agree with the professor that China has established a political system based on People's Congress, and people can vote uh, deputies for the National People's Congress. And those deputies are usually some outstanding figures of Chinese society which represent interests of people and they seek happiness for the people. So I think that China, Chinese democracy is for sure has its own char characteristics and specialties. And we can see that China is developing vastly towards its own democracy. Mm. Yeah, in 
indeed. And also, I think there, uh, maybe there, there are some misunderstandings uh, for those who are outside of China, uh, because especially in the West, uh, sometimes China or China's political system is being so villainized, uh, depict, depicting China as a dictatorship. So there's no point to understand their political system. But actually, uh, like Professor Liu mentioned, China actually consult with these people uh, and everyone, I mean, for it, ev annually, we have these two sessions, two sessions every year around March. Mm -hmm. it's, it's two, two sessions include the National People's Congress and uh, the, which we call also NPC, mm -hmm. and also the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, um, Zheng Xie, in short, CPPCC. So every year, you know, these deputies, these deputies are really, the meetings first from bottom level, like from the village, township, and then county, province. city, uh, province. provincial level, and then the national level. So basically the issue Short observation. Yeah. Short <laughs> observation here. Uh, it's, it's so interesting to hear for the view from China. Now, I visited China only once, short time, uh -huh. 2019. Uh, but I was struck by the level of enthusiasm, enthusiasm, which you just don't see here. Um, people had opinions all the time on everything, and you could ask people's opinions, and they'd tell you right off the bat. Uh, you know, here sometimes there's just such an alienation. Folks mm -hmm. don't have opinions, maybe a growl, but not much in, in the way of opinions. And you can step over homeless people in the streets, on the subways. But what I saw in China was a level of enthusiasm. Uh, and, and that is really dramatic. And it's a dramatic difference that kind of isn't described quite in, in, in democracy, but there's a, a much deeper level of, of harmony in the society and, and participation real participation and and you can just hear it when you ask folks a question on almost anything they'll tell you right off the bat mm -hmm. I, and i enjoyed that immensely thank you especially in taxi ride as well <laughs> <laughs> you have, you yes. have yes. Yes. the most amazing conversation with taxi oh, yeah. drivers. Yes. <laughs> um, to, to back up what sarah said uh, you know i was working in washington dc so and almost every day i covered the whole world news and there's trouble here, there's problem there, there is this here, there is that here. Oh, U U.S. thinks China is blah, 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 blah. But then I don't see any security problem. I don't see any poverty problem. I don't see any polit political problem. And it made me confused. Why is there this much distrust and negative publicity while there's not so many problems? And as a journalist, I was naturally curious. So I came here to see for myself. And now I've been here for six years. Mm. <laughs> Nick is waving to me again. <laughs> what do you want to yeah, say? I want to add to my experience living in China. Well, I personally seen how uh, students in my university were choosing their deputies in our campus. Uh. And I noticed that how patriotic China is, how people love the country, love the government. I never seen that much love towards the government and the country in any other countries. No way, that's brainwashed. <laughs> brainwashed Chinese people, no. as a lot of people in the West would say. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I get Let it. Let them come and see themselves. Yeah, then people are, do have their opinions. Like I mentioned, the deputies to the National People's Congress, you know, according to the latest, uh, the white book on China's democracy, uh, there's just some statistics, like 2.5 million people have worked as deputies mm. on all levels, from village to national levels. 2.5 million people have been deputies. And 94% 94, 94 are working at the very grassroots levels, like village levels, township levels, city levels. So you know, 94% really have really close ties to the grassroots people. That's how they raise all the issues, uh, advice, suggestions from bottom, the, the grassroots people to the national level, and then make all those, to try to solve those problems through decision-making, policy-making process. And also, uh, we have this uh, consultative <laughs> conference. It's not just Communist Party deciding something. It's every problem, everything is discussed through this uh, consultation progress, and consults with eight other parties, 
and also with people from with no party affiliations, for example, different sectors, business, entertainment. Actually, there are I think I can list two very famous members to this consultative conference. Jackie Chen is a member oh, yes. to the, the CPPCC, the Political Consultative Conference. He's been a member for I think over ten years. Yeah. He's he served three terms. Yeah. That's served fifteen many times years. Many years. Yeah. So <laughs> and, uh, no, last time he was trying to raise the uh, make a proposal how to combine movie industry, entertainment industry with poverty alleviation projects. Uh, Yao Ming yeah. is a member to the Political Consultative Conference, and. Last time he made a proposal how to uh, make sports, especially basketball, more popular among kids. Basically, like uh, he's trying to bring more, give more exercise, more PE classes to other kids here in China. So there are so many people actually making proposals, making advice into the national level decision policy making process. And something very important that I want people who are not here outside China to understand is actually the foundation that is laid even when people are kids. I have seven year olds and they have to choose one person who is going to be their representative mm -hmm. uh, for the party in class. And the way it's done, the way they advise, choose somebody who you really think is good for this. And they all voted. We counted it transparently. They yeah. saw that. And then this person became the winner. The kids who were not in class, maybe they were at home not feeling good. We called them and put them on speakerphone. And they voted so that everyone was here. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this is the person who won. And I think that foundation, even while you are a kid, you've mm. been given a foundation of how to think or to choose a leader. That's very important. Not you growing up and seeing violence or seeing all these kind of things that happen, like for example, you know, storming the Capitol Hill, that doesn't give you a good ideology as a kid of what democracy really is. Mm. I did that many times as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to pass this question to Roland. Actually, oh Adam, I will I will come back to you uh, no, later. No, okay. I promise you. Okay. But I, uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. Uh, Roland recently published a book, uh, it's called Chinese uh, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics: A Guide for Foreigners, a book in English. So I want to ask you, Roland, because uh, as we talked, as we we discussed, I mean China China is being villainized so much, and there are not so much interest in the West to understand China's political system. So how do we explain the Chinese political system? How do we make people truly understand what's the, the real situation here? Yeah, there's, there's many ways. And obviously, uh, this, this show is one of them. Uh, what CGTN is doing and others uh, is very, very good. Uh, another way is actually, and for the, the, uh, the studio guests there in Beijing, uh, actually to go to China if you've never been and spend a good bit of time there, um, preferably try and learn the language. I'm a scholar, uh, so the book you mentioned, it, uh, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, a Guide for Foreigners, it's written in English. Um, it relies about 95% on Chinese language scientific scholarship. And there's a wealth of scholarship about uh, China's socialist system, uh, its economy, uh, political system, socialist democracy, or whole process, people's democracy. A wealth of research, scientific research, from grassroots democratic practices right through to the structures of the National People's Congress or the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress, and so on. There's a wealth of scholarship. And one way, it takes longer. It takes longer, but more of that high quality scientific scholarship, if that can be made available in other languages for people to study, to see how scientifically it's based, how things actually work in China, would also be of great assistance so that people actually are informed. Thank you. And Anham, um, as I promised, I come back to you. What do you want to say? <laughs> okay, I, I will back to your main question about like how I think about the democracy in China because I'm living here six years ago and I studied here and now I'm working here so uh, maybe I, I can share some of my uh, uh, you know uh, 
experience here. So, sure. But, but first, in general, uh, to, to judge whether a country is democracy or, a, in general, also a, demo, a, a, a political system, if it's good or not, it's important uh, to check for the interest of who this system works. Like, uh, as Sarah mentioned before, you know, so if it's for people, this means it's a good one. It's a good, uh, and again, I, I mean, I said what I mean about um, uh, people. So based on that, we can check the Chinese uh, model, okay? So the Chinese model first has lifted more than 800 million people out of extreme poverty, which means it's work for those people. And this is good. It's perfect, you know? And the second point, and also this because my experiment here, so that the Chinese people during the pandemic, uh, I mean the Chinese model during the pandemic has been able to protect people's lives. And uh, during the pandemic period, I, I was in Wuhan. I was uh, like uh, studying in Wuhan. So the government acted on the idea of people's lives come first. And we saw that, you know, and here, to make it more clear, I can make some comparison with, with uh, other countries, especially the United States. So, in the United States, more than 48 million cases, you know, or, or, or like uh, infected by, by COVID. And in China, it's around 94,000 cases. And here we are speaking about like 1.4 billion people in China, which is like four times more than the United States. And if we speak about the uh, death, it's, it's unbelievable, you know. In the United States, it's around 800,000, and in China, it's, it's 4,000. So, in the same time, if we look for the like, uh, rich people in the United States, or the billionaire, they increased their wealth like four or five times during the pandemic. So, people die, but rich start to be more rich. So, here you can you can like uh, uh, know for who this model work and in China also because we still till now uh, the, the the pandemic under control this one zero cases policy so uh, these two these two things are very important for me but I will add one point it's about the trust. One of the most important measures if this country or this uh, political system or democracy is good for those people or not, you have to ask people. So uh, let me read some, some results, you know, from some studies. In July 2020, researchers from Harvard University conclude that the people's trust in Chinese government rose from 89% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. This, it was before pandemic. They published like in 2020, but this research before pandemic. After pandemic, another research, they conclude that the Chinese people confidence in the government rose after the effort to control the pandemic and reached 98%. So let me take my opinion, you know. So if trust is a measure of good democracy, I think the Chinese one is good. Thank you. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also, you mentioned poverty alleviation. I know you really care about that. And also, the COVID control. Uh, as uh, before, I know that you wrote books about your experience living under lockdowns in Wuhan when the outbreak happened. The so, question is the copyright is already transmitted to Chinese additional huh? copyright. The the copyright belongs to to who? Chinese uh, edition. Is already. that a Chinese uh, company publishing house? Not yeah, really. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. I, I published first in Arabic, but after that, uh, there is a publisher house here in China. They translate it to Chinese and English. Oh, yeah, oh cool. A different it's, languages. This is the English version. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> the, the, that's what we can say. Yeah. What is well, the difference? Well, let me say a word about censorship in the U.S. <laughs> okay, sure. Oh, that's new. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's very much connected to COVID. Mm. Now, uh, I prepared an anthology, a book, by 50 
pretty prominent known uh, political commentators, but uh, critical of the US government. This book, it was called Capitalism on a Ventilator, the impact of COVID-19 in China and the US. Hmm. And so each of the commentators was looking at what is the problem in the US and why the numbers are so high and why the infrastructure wasn't working and the lack of coordination. And they were also looking at what China was doing. Now, this book, uh, and uh, we, we placed it on Amazon, and we found that Amazon, which is the largest distributor, banned the book. We tried to put out uh, uh, publicity through the standard uh, companies that handle uh, press releases and so on. They would not even do it, even though they'll, they'll advertise anything under the sun. You know, this is, these are corporations that just operate for... So censorship, I mean, we, we were able to publish a book by paying a printer, you know, and, and we expect that very soon it will be, it has been translated into Chinese and will be published in China. But the point of the shutdown, that what was not allowed as a discussion in the United States was what was happening here that was so wrong, whether testing, vaccines. Now, the book came out a year ago, just as vaccines were rolling in. And everywhere in the media in the United States, it was, this would solve everything. Just to say earlier promised, you know, their own little test would solve everything. That's not what happened. So the vaccines came out a year ago. And the rate of COVID deaths since then in the United States has tripled, has tripled. It, it's staggering when you think of it. And, and yet China's rate <laughs> remains still under 5,000. So it's grown now to 800,000 uh, COVID deaths because still the lack of coordination. And even though the vaccine is available, the US has the lowest rate of full vaccination of any of the industrialized countries. And because the vaccine is for profit, countries in Africa don't even have 2% of the population yet vaccinated. So China has not only vaccinated its own population, it's providing billions of vaccines around the world, and more important even, the vaccine technology, the ability of countries to make vaccines. Now that is exactly what the pharmaceutical industry does not want to have happen in the US. So we're paying a price, the world is paying a price as there's new variants that emerge and will continue to emerge. This is a virus. We can deal with it scientifically, we can deal with it with planning. We can show it can be controlled, as China has shown. Or it can be completely out of control, and then they censor any comparison. And that, that is, what's that for democracy? You can't even have a discussion of this in the United States. Even if the book is right in hand and has prominent, uh, uh, you know, uh, commentators, uh, prominent in terms of these are our left uh, alternative commentators, but well known, uh, making these comparisons. So I, I just wanted to add that on censorship, uh, censorship even of the discussion on such a life and death issue. And mm. we do pay the price. Sure, sure. Uh, Sarah, I agree with you. And uh, the one thing that really fascinates me when it comes to COVID-19 is people talk about their freedoms. <laughs> their freedoms to get a vaccine or not, their freedoms to wear a face mask or not. This is how I see it. When mom says, no more candy for you, there's a reason she does that. You want to eat a hamburger every day, and she says, no, not every day you eat a hamburger. Eventually, when you grow up, you realize, actually, she's doing you a favor, and now this is the benefit. Maybe at that time, you might feel a little bit inconvenient, but now you're much healthier, now you're much better, or now you have better teeth. And some people really still don't understand this concept. Mm. So imagine having a room of kids to vote whether they should have hamburger for lunch every day. <laughs> they get fat. Yeah. A lot of them. <laughs> yeah. And Professor Liu, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I just want to say, so I want to ask the Madam the Professor in New York, how many scholars uh, as she that in the United States, as we know that uh, 
seldom or very few American scholars that uh, can speak freely, objectively about China and tell the truth about China. If we have thousands of such scholars in the USA, I think that Mr. Biden cannot do what's what he wants. So this is the point that the so-called democracy should make the people to think the real mm. truth and the facts. If they are ordered not to say the truth and the facts, there's no democracy. So that's why this is a similar question for the vaccination in the USA. Many people, they say, oh, this is my own freedom. I can decide whether I should do a vaccination or not. But he forgot to say, if he didn't do it, he could influence the security of other people, could have some impact on the other people. This is the point. They violate the real uh, value of their own institution, or constitution value. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, since we did I answer? Or not? Uh, yeah, sure. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Uh, how many people? There's millions of people in the United States that admire or are very interested in China. But for the past few years, there is a conscious policy in the United States to shut those voices down. There's nowhere in the major corporate media that those voices are heard anymore. And they're being shut out of academia, right, left, and center, all over the place, along with Chinese students. So many Chinese students, their visas are now blocked. This is a conscious policy that goes together. Uh, the ability of people to speak and to oppose uh, this, this growing confrontation, that is kept out of the media. What you hear relentlessly, and, and you can open a newspaper any day of the week, and there will be two and three really negative articles about China that, that haven't even been fact-checked. Uh, so you can look at the, the whole campaign on, on Xinjiang uh, and, and the Uyghurs. I mean, it is a huge funding that is going into a conscious anti-China campaign. The news every night will have a piece against China and a shut off of the voices. And there, there are many, many in the United States who are deeply interested in looking at China, especially among young people. And they do find pieces of information on the internet, on alternative media, but it's not in the corporate media. So mm. very good question. Where are those voices that were mm. uh, so many people who visited China who now can't say a thing mm -hmm. in the major media? Sounds I, I, and yeah. This is certainly true for me, but lots, lots of others who are well published mm -hmm. and now have no voice. Are you worried about the similar situation that shortly before the Second World War in Germany, just uh, after the Nazi administration came to power. Because the first uh, they control all the opinions, especially public opinion. Uh, many people are now worrying about the similar situation now is uh, happening in the United States. Sounds like the censorship is only to censor positive voices positive voices from China and about China. But you right. are free to, to criticize or demonize no, to China. Claim to like like so I said earlier, standards. I came to see. And when I came, I, I realized it's the opposite of what I read to my audience every single day. Oh. And I had people come in, they wanted to take pictures. They, they want to have a conversation. <laughs> they want to talk. They look much happier. The streets smell like delicious food. And I was like, how comes I didn't know that this country actually does exist? And That's why are these people yeah. so happy? Why is the taxi driver really wanted, so interested in me? Why is he not complaining <laughs> about his life? Like, this is something that really made me just kind of reevaluate how I think and actually what the media is doing to us to influence what we think. And now I do, I've lost friends in America because I've been here for six years. There's one, she's, uh, she used to be my teacher, and she just doesn't have any positive 
thinking about China because she's never been here and she only understands what the media tells her, even though she's an amazing person. And if she actually knows how this system works, she will help influence a lot more people. I think it's really interesting transition of yourself when you work as a journalist for VOA in yes. the United States, you were actually reading negative news about China. Yes, that's what I did every time. day, yes. And then you came to China, leave. So I was curious, I was like, why is it that I read all this negative news, but there's no security problem, there's no healthcare problem, there's no uh, uh, economic problem, mm -hmm. and I don't see the people complaining or protesting every day while that's <laughs> the other news that I read on other countries. Mm. So I was like, I'm gonna go and see. I'm a journalist, I'm an independent journalist, and I'm really curious. I wanna see and feel it. And I came here for a week, and then the next thing I know is I'm thinking of a way to come back. Wow. <laughs> because I had such a good experience in Nanjing. Yeah. Kind of makes sense, because if you know who is funding VOA, I'm not to <laughs> condemn your former employer, but the VOA was also funded by NED. <laughs> so, kind of makes sense of this. Uh, the recent leader of VOA was changed because they were promoting more pro-China news. Wow, really? Yes. A little Interesting. Really like here. your, your, your uh, input here. And also, Nick, I think you want to add something? Uh, yeah. you, earlier you were waving your hands yeah, again. Yeah, I just wanted to add that democracy with so-called dual standards. That's all. Hypocrisy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we talk about COVID-19, um, how people are fighting with this pandemic so much. And actually, we have uh, two more clips, two more videos mm -hmm. that uh, made by our, our guests could, cannot join live today. Uh, so one is actually a medic who fought in the front line um, with the COVID-19. And, and another is a uh, teacher who were volunteered to serve at the rural regions in China. So both of them are going to tell us the democracy in the grassroots level. So let's take a look at those videos. I am honored to participate in the work of supporting education and poverty elevation in Hongyuan country, Sichuan province. The place we served it at the lowest level of poverty in China. And now the children here are studying in schools with a relative well-equipped hardware with the help of the government. Our team take improving the quality of local education and teaching as the central task. During the pandemic in 2020, I had a student named Apo who was injured in grazing and needed sugary which had a big impact on his family. We have focused on students in need, carried out the Gelsin Flower Love 1 Plus 1 help action for school orphans. Over the past seven years, the total amount of the donated funds and goods has reached more than 5 million yuan. Today, the Gelsin for Flower team has formed a three support education project service model of supporting the herd, supporting education and wisdom, and aiding poverty elevation with the strong support of the state, society, and school. Hello everyone, I am an ordinary young medical worker in China. As we all know, the epidemic has spread all over the world for more than two years. In the past two years, I have witnessed the initial large-scale city lockdowns as well as the current policy of regular prevention and control and dynamic zero-COVID policy in various parts of China. I'm going to show you an example just half a month ago. My city started emergency response of the epidemic because three confirmed cases were in Suzhou. And this is also my first time visually witnessing the handling of the epidemic of the whole city. Within 24 hours, doctors make full use of big data to quickly investigate close contacts. Medical staff tested nuclear acid tests overnight. Community volunteers did a good job in information communication. Residents fully cooperate with sampling. November 25th, Students at a primary school in Suzhou had a very special Thanksgiving Day. 
Because of the epidemic prevention, the school required a temporary nu nucleic acid test for all staff. In the process of waiting, in the face of nervous children, teachers took out snacks and candy to cheer and cheer the children on. Long queues for testing on the playground, games and storytelling in the classroom, logistics procurement of temporary bread and cakes. All teachers and students and medical staff were busy late into the night. This kind of humanization of the process allowed us to see human calmness and confidence ahead of any disaster. Well, what goes hand in hand with the epidemic prevention and control is vaccination. Everyone can get free vaccination. Vaccination work is a big task. But in high intensity work, doctors have also received many warm gifts from citizens. And as a vaccination doctor, I have also received children in kindergarten handmade greeting cards like this, like this, hand painted bags like this. So cute. These warm moments affirm the feeling of appreciation. Very cute. I just want to add a one more story about this because uh, like Adam, I was also in Wuhan during the lockdowns. I was one of the reporters who were reporting the whole situation during the uh, lockdowns in Wuhan when the, the, the COVID-19 broke out. And I went to uh, ICUs and makeshift hospitals, uh, interview patients and doctors. And you know what, in one of the makeshift hospitals, the medics, not only they are testing patients every day, uh, checking temperatures, uh, giving them food, like everything. Uh, the, the one thing that the nurse has to do is give this uh, consultants, just talk to the patients, because some patients went through horrible tragedies. And some of them are not, even though they only have mild symptoms, the mental trauma was huge. Uh, one kid lost three of his family members, parent, parents and also an un uncle, and some, some lost their lifelong loved ones. I mean, the, the trauma, this, some couldn't see the last, uh, the, 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 to meet their parents for the last time because they were separated. Their parents were died in the hospital and they were isolated in the makeshift hospital. Very tragic moment for all of them. But the doctors, even though they have to wear the hazmat suit for eight hours a day because of very limited numbers of uh, the, the suit at that time, they themselves were overwhelmed, but they gave these consultants every day, talk to them, make sure they recover mm. mentally, tirelessly. And you know, in the end, I found out this nurse was actually suffering from cancer, other diseases herself, but she volunteered mm. to go to Wuhan to work in the makeshift hospital and also, I mean, I want to make sure this kid, after he recovered from COVID-19, he will also recover from this uh, sadness, from tragic in the family. So there's so much support. Also, we can see how the city pulled together this collectivism in the society. I mean, community workers, sometimes just dozens of people, tw 10 to 20 people, uh, deliver food and groceries door to door for thousands of household. I mean, it's a, such a commitment from the local community workers, from the medics, and how this city, everyone was pulling together to try to get back together. So I think that's the spirit we need during crisis. And, and this is why I think everyone in China, you know, call Wuhan the city of hero. Mm. And, and, and they, everyone you mentioned just now and in the video, they're, they're, they're the true fighters for democracy. Mm. It's because of them we can enjoy democracy in China. Mm. Um, so, so I think, you know, this is a testimonial, you know, the, and, and, and sometimes we take it for granted. But, but those, you know, thousands and millions of people fight for democracy every day so we can enjoy what we have. Um, so, so thank you for, for, for them, wherever they are. Yeah, thanks to those uh, heroes. And uh, I have a few questions. If I'm hungry, would I volunteer to really try to help other people? If I don't mm. trust the government, if the government doesn't take care of me, will I really put my life on the, on the line and go and just serve thousands and thousands of people? If I don't feel safe, if I go out, something might happen to me or somebody might shoot me. Will I do that? Mm -hmm. These are important questions that people outside should really mm -hmm. think about. Mm -hmm. 
uh, very interesting, very deep discussions we just had. And now I think I want to move to my last question. Mm. What is the ultimate goal of democracy? We care democracy so much. Every country is, is uh, trying to figure out a way what's the right democracy for their people. But what's the ultimate goal? So I will go each of you. Uh, can you briefly tell us what's your thought on this? Uh, probably maybe start with you, Bello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, um, freedom, prosperity, safety, and happiness. I think these four things are extremely important. If you can have that in a society, I think that should be democratic. I don't know, you, it doesn't really need to have a name, but you should be able to live in a place where you are happy, uh, you will have everything you need, you have education, and you also feel safe. Mm. Thank you. Enough? So democracy um, should be a tool to solve problems, should be a tool to govern. It should not be a tool to create, um, to create you know, uh, chaos. It should not be a tool um, as, as, a, as a public stunt. Right? It should not be a tool to meet for media headlines. When, when, when I think of democracy, you know, the top 10% of any country should be an aspiration. But when we look at democracy for progress, we shouldn't look at how, how much the halves have progress, how much the halves have even more halves. But we should look at the bottom 10% of that country and how much the have-nots have progress, how their life are living. And, and I think that should be the ultimate goal is making the bottom 10% of every single country better off. And, and if we can do that, I'm sure, you know, we, we can get a stronger middle class, we can get a stronger country, stronger economy and, and a better standard of living. So I think that's the ultimate goal, is to concern, to look at the have-nots mm -hmm. and make their life better. Mm. Very good answer. Thank Professor you. Liu? So I think that democracy itself, I mean, is neutral. It depends on who operates, who manages it. It can be managed in China as a delicious food, very mm. nice. In the United States, it could be poisoned. So it depends on who take it, who need it. So democracy itself is neutral. But I would prefer to say that all mankind should unite together to make oh. same efforts to build up a shared democracy, shared happiness, shared future. Thank you. And Nick? Well, I think it's a very hard question to answer because everyone has different uh, perception of it. So, but I think I would say that, just like I said before, I think it's the equality of opportunities. Because no matter how hard we try, it's basically impossible to make our society equal to everyone because of the differences between gender, between the beliefs, also the backgrounds. So what I think democracy is trying to do is to establish equality for everyone and to uh, provide the quality of chances to everyone. Thank you. And also to our online, online guests, Sarah, what's your thoughts? Well, this is every part of this is so interesting. Uh, if we're going to talk about future goals, and I think it is always important to think, where are we going? What do we want for the future? That famous quote, of from each according to our ability to each according to our needs uh, and and really uh, nothing is ever complete equality even in a future society but in whose interest does society exist and it is is it to build greater and greater equality or is it to build greater and greater concentrations of capital and wealth and private ownership so We've been talking about that comparison today. Now, China is not yet utopia, but it is consciously building toward, um, and its policies are directed. Uh, and I think this is an important uh, uh, accomplishment 
of the Communist Party of China. The, 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 the Chinese Communist Party is a worker and peasant, a party of the people. So it fights for their interests. That's very different from the United States where the politicians they acknowledge, and as was described here, it's a plutocracy. It's not a democracy. And it has become greater and greater concentrations of wealth and privilege and less and less participation of any kind of the people. So we want to see a future goal. Now, there are capitalists in China. There are, that's true. But they don't call the shots. In any crisis, it wasn't the Chinese capitalists or the, is this profitable for the pharmaceutical industries? Is this profitable here? Is this no. Do the people need to be protected? That was a question in Wuhan immediately. And everything in the society went to provide the immediate needs in a crisis, along with the long-term needs and planning, because the infrastructure planning, very impressive in China, but also in a crisis, there was a response to <laughs> what are the needs of even one section of the country from each according to our needs. And the Chinese people responded with, with an outpouring. Now, in the United States, there were so many self-sacrificing medical workers. I mean, people who, who did risk their lives and gave their lives. Uh, so it's not that there wasn't self-sacrifice here, but there was no coordination. Medical workers are wearing shower caps and, and, and raincoats for protection. They didn't have hazmat suits. Uh, they're making bandanas for, for masks. It, it was complete chaos and breakdown here. And with, with refrigerator trucks at, at nursing homes for the dead bodies just down the street from me. So complete uh, chaos here and fear and alienation. But I did see many medical workers and others who, who did their best in this chaotic situation. So you don't lose faith in, in human nature, but you got to look at the system and who it operates for. And uh, I do think there was what's needed in China from each according to their needs. And at that moment, it was in Wuhan and everyone gave. So there is a, a real future that you're building toward. Thank you, Sarah. And Hedham, what do you think? What's the ultimate goal yeah. of democracy? Yeah, maybe if we go back to the definition of democracy uh, as a political regime, and any political system should, like, representing the, the interest of the people and build a be better life for them, and and also solve problems faced by people. So. I think this is the goal of, of any political system, any, any regime. So in general, uh, if the main question is about who controls the government, I think the most important is for who, you know, this, this, uh, this government works. For the ma majority of people or for the minority, and here I mean minority like the 1%, the top 1%. So for me, the, the short answer is, the, the uh, goal of democracy is the happiness of people. And under this, this title, you can add all what, like, uh, all what you said now. Thank you. And Roland, last but not least. Yes, well, uh, I mean, democracy is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And uh, Sarah's already quoted one sentence from Marx and Engels, and I do work in a school of Marxism, from each according to ability to each according to need. So I'm going to quote another one. The ultimate aim of democracy is a society in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And that's also from Marx and Engels. Thank you, Roland. So. Mm. All of you shared your opinions, and I think democracy, of course, is a form of government, but no matter what forms the government is, whether it adhere to the commitment um, to make people's life better, to serve the interests of public good, 
If they did it, it's a good government. It is democracy. Like we mentioned earlier, democracy in ancient Greek means people rule. In Chinese, 民主, it means exactly people rule. <laughs> so yes, we do have democracy here. We do have democracy in China. And also, uh, as our foreign ministers, China always say, we are not trying to export our system. It's China find its best way to serve its people, the best way to make China progress. And I think every country should find, to have, have their right to find the best way to develop their own country. And thank all of you for this fruitful discussion. Thank all of you joining us uh, everywhere. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for watching. Uh, if you like it, leave a comment and also don't forget to continue to stay tuned with the chat room on CGTN. Bye-bye.